I speak to you in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. It is such a pleasure to be here, and so lovely to see all of you in person, and to know that some of you, perhaps those who have snuck off to the cottage, are online as well. When I was here with you last, I was Louise Simos, and now you'll see I'm Louise Didem. I have reclaimed my original name. There were so many riches in the text today, I wasn't sure where to go, and I was very tempted by Lydia. That first reading about Lydia, Lydia was a woman who was the head of her household. She was a merchant, a prosperous merchant in purple cloth, and she was in charge of her household and came to be baptized and welcomed Jesus to her home. So for those of us like me, who are the women in charge of their household, she speaks a very important story. But what I am going to explore today is really what is going on for the disciples in this gospel passage from John and what it means for me and perhaps for you. Even though this is the season of Easter, we are looking back. If this was a movie, well, this gospel reading is a flashback to a time before Jesus was crucified. It forms part of a long section in John's Gospel, chapters 13 to 17, his farewell discourse, bookended at one end by Jesus washing the disciples' feet at the beginning, and Judas' betrayal of Jesus that puts Jesus on the path to death and resurrection at the end. It's a set of explanations and final instructions to the disciples. Through this whole farewell discourse, Jesus has been explaining what will happen next, preparing the disciples for his death and resurrection. But I think the disciples must be quite worried when he says Jesus is leaving them to go somewhere they cannot follow. And surely their hearts are troubled Surely they're afraid and anxious. The whole of Jerusalem is in turmoil. And we know that their fear, their lack of courage, will look like cowardice. When Jesus is arrested and crucified, they will run away. Simon Peter will deny Jesus three times before the cock crows. There will be strife and conflict. There will be death. Death on a cross for their teacher, Jesus. And the disciples will suffer the grief of death and loss. The grief of death and loss that many of us here have suffered when we have lost a loved one. It's the kind of loss that leaves you breathless, that knocks the breath right out of you. But in our passage today, Jesus reassures the disciples, saying, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. So while the disciples were probably troubled, there is hope in this announcement. When Jesus is gone, the Holy Spirit will come. Let's look for a minute at who or what is the Holy Spirit. Spirit is translated from the Greek word pneuma, from which we get the word pneumatic, applied to tools and machines that are powered by air or gas or wind. And indeed, the Greek word pneuma <coughs> can mean wind, breath, or spirit, depending on the context. A little sidebar here. 
You know we are surrounded by so many male images of God. And our translation uses the pronouns he and him for the Holy Spirit. But I don't. The Greek word pneuma, spirit, breath, wind, is not masculine nor feminine. It's actually a neuter noun. So when scripture personifies the Holy Spirit, and this translation uses the pronoun he and not it, it's already a little off. Certainly, we never see it using she. So I use the pronoun she, and perhaps that will help you see the Holy Spirit a little bit in a different way. Anyway, enough diversion. Jesus tells the disciples that the Holy Spirit, that she, the holy breath, is coming. And Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the advocate. More Greek, the Greek word is paraclete. Paraclete is one of those rich Greek words. It means the one who answers the call. Someone who defends and comforts, who speaks up for and even carries a person. Sometimes translated as advocate or comforter, consoler, helper. It carries the sense of someone who is called to come along alongside you, to support you. So the Holy Spirit is not just the divine breath of life, she is a helper, a teacher, a counselor. Her task here is to teach the disciples and remind them of Jesus' teachings. She will see, support them in the challenges to come and will see her descend in fire at Pentecost. And when the disciples can't even breathe because of their grief, and sorrow. The Holy Spirit will come alongside them to restore their spirit and their very breath. When the way forward seems impossible, she will breathe hope and courage into them. When we lose our breath, when we can't breathe in fear and grief, she breathes divine life into us. The Holy Spirit is the presence of God who comes alongside us and whispers the words of Julian of Norwich in our ear. All shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of thing shall be well. Even when the evil powers of the world threaten to knock the very breath of hope out of us, just as the crucifixion did to the disciples, the Holy Spirit breathes new life and courage into us. We are never abandoned, even in the midst of the loss and pain and sorrow that are a part of the life in this broken world of ours. The Holy Spirit is always with us. And she reminds us of who Jesus is. Someone who loves us, who forgives us, and who teaches us to love others as he loved us. Someone we follow. So you might think of following Jesus with the Holy Spirit beside you. Now, I certainly needed the Holy Spirit to walk beside me when I grappled with my call to holy orders. For many years, the whole thing seemed impossible. I couldn't imagine how I could respond to God's call. And the Holy Spirit never left me alone, even when I ignored her. You see, I thought God's plan for me was impossible unrealistic and ridiculous. God couldn't want me. I had plans. I earned a Bachelor of Commerce and Finance degree, the furthest you could get from religion. I had a family. I launched a career. 
And whenever there was a risk of a little silence where the Holy Spirit might get my attention, I got busier. But when I stopped being busy for a moment, inconveniently, God's call was still there. The Holy Spirit whispered in my heart about a different vocation, a different plan, God's plan for me. Now I think she has quite a sense of humor because when the Holy Spirit couldn't get through to me, she took to waking me up in the deep silence of 3 a.m. It still did seem impossible, really hard. A three-year Master's of Divinity degree, a full-time unpaid internship, days of interviews and reference checks and essays and psychological testing, a starting salary that was and is what I was earning in the late 1990s. And that's not adjusted for inflation. Impossible, right? Did I mention I am the head of my household? There is a Yiddish saying, man, or in my case, woman, plans and God laughs. I tell you, this woman planned and God laughed. Woken too often at 3 a.m. by the Holy Spirit, eventually I learned to allow her to come alongside me and guide me. I kept putting one foot ahead of another in the fog, trusting her guidance to lead me and soon I found the hand of Jesus outstretched to take me. Through most of my 14-year journey to ordination, I could not even see the final step. Often I couldn't even see the next step. I just trusted the Holy Spirit, as you might trust a guide in the wilderness to walk beside me and guide me in the right direction. She also opened my heart to accept support from so many people who helped and encouraged me. And some of those people are here in this congregation. Thank you. You supported me in 2017 during my full-time internship here when I was discerning my impossible call to ordination, and again in 2021 when I was a postulant and Zoom deacon. So strengthened by the Holy Spirit with her acting in you and in many others, despite my insistence that God's plan was impossible, <laughs> I was ordained transitional deacon just on May 1st, and God willing, I will be ordained a priest next year. I begin my first appointment at Wasaga Beach in August. And you know what? The Holy Spirit is not waking me up at 3 a.m. anymore. Recently, I have been reading the First Nations version of the New Testament. And it gives a different and important voice to the translation of our scriptures. It describes the Holy Spirit this way. The one who will walk beside us and be our spirit guide. As the wisdom keeper who will help us remember what Jesus has told us. Wisdom keeper, spirit guide. And what resonated most for me, it describes the Holy Spirit as the one who will always walk beside you and guide you on the good road. And indeed, she has guided me well. Holy Spirit, teacher, advocate, helper, divine breath of life.
the guide who comes to walk beside us on our journey, the one who will always walk beside us and guide us on the good road. So as I leave here today and get ready to move to Wasega Beach on the weekend, this is my blessing, my hope for you, that the Holy Spirit will always walk beside you and guide you on the good road, on the road that brings each of you closer to Jesus, and on the road that brings this community together for good. Amen.